Welcome to Theological Table Talk, a podcast produced by the Center for Christian Studies. I'm Keith Stanglin, and I'm joined, as always, by Todd Hall. Hi, Todd. How's it going? Good. Really good. well today. All right. Yeah. Well, it's good to uh, see you and uh, to welcome all of you here to our discussion of Christians and politics is our topic for this episode uh, Christians in politics is pretty broad. Um, one reason, and this conversation could go a number of directions, but one reason we're wanting to talk about this is because one of our uh, recent journal issues, the Journal of Christian Studies, was um, focused on this theme of the church and the polis. This is the May 2023 issue. So I know that some of our subscribers um, to the Center for Christian Studies and to our journal um, have um, already read this. I've just, in fact, this past weekend gotten some really good feedback on this particular journal issue that someone is still sort of working through. And we thought it'd be a good idea on uh, the podcast, since it's a little more informal and obviously conversational than uh, a journal issue, uh, is just to talk about some of these uh, topics in in this format, that to make it a little more accessible. I'm almost thinking about this conversation as a supplement to the journal issue, and in a way, um, maybe an introduction to it. So if someone listens to this and then is interested in that journal issue. Maybe they have it already. Maybe they want to get it. Um, This will be a good kind of background and just laying the foundation for being able to get into the articles that are really uh, very good in in the May 2023 issue. So uh, one of the best ways to do this, we thought, was to have a couple of the contributors uh, of that issue join us today in our conversation. And so we're really happy to have Ben Peterson and Zach McCartney join us for this episode. Uh, Ben and Zach, if you don't mind, just uh, tell us briefly uh, who you are, uh, what you do, and and where you are. Uh, Well, thanks, Keith uh, and Todd, very much for for having us on. Uh, My name is Ben Peterson. I teach uh, political science at Abilene Christian University in the Department of Political Science and Criminal Justice. Just finished my second year teaching there, um, and so that's kind of what that's kind of what I do. And and I had the uh, the honor and privilege of of guest editing the um, uh, this the JCS uh, issue that you mentioned. Yeah, uh, we're really happy that uh, Ben that you stepped in to help us edit this. You provided some expertise in political science and. Uh, a lot of those issues that, frankly, Todd and I uh, didn't have. So uh, thank you for that. Zach? Yeah, my name is Zachary McCartney. I'm the uh, college minister at Hillcrest Church of Christ, which is right across the street from Abilene Christian. I also adjunct. I teach Old Testament and New Testament sometimes um, here at ACU for freshmen and sophomores. Um, and I lead tours to Israel uh, over the summer. So I'm more more on the practitioner side of Ben and I's little duo. Nice. Okay. So sometimes you get out of the Texas heat to go to Israel, another desert. So. Hey, you know, uh, yes, sir. Yes. Sir. <laughs> Good. Okay. How, so how long have you two uh, known each other and, and been in cahoots on these things? Yeah, Ben and I, we met when Ben was finishing his PhD work in College Station. Uh, I'm an Aggie, uh, my undergraduate degree, and... <laughs> Uh, we met at the AM Church Christ and just kind of started talking, connected for coffee and stuff, and are just very interested in the same things. And he took the academic political science study route. I took the kind of building up the church institutionally, practitionally route. And he's been a great conversation partner uh, for the last, oh, shoot, what, seven years, Ben, something like that? I, I don't even know. Yeah, it's been it's been a few. Um, a couple of years ago, Zach and I had um, the opportunity to the first time we co-authored was for a piece um, in um, an outlet that, that was called Breaking Ground. It was kind of, I think it was kind of a one year project uh, under I think it was under the auspices of the of of Cardis. Um, and um, so we were starting to develop the kind of the view that we 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 also sort of develop in uh, in our piece uh, for this issue in, in that our essay. 
Okay, great. Well, it's really good to have you all here with us. And there are four of us here. So um, I'm going to kind of step in and maybe MC with a few big questions, but uh, let you know, feel free to uh, inject questions of your own or uh, uh, topics that uh, I may not have asked about that you think are relevant. Um, the uh, so Ben, yeah, helped us uh, in editing this uh, issue, and then Ben and Zach uh, contributed to a an article that we'll talk about here in just a moment. But I wanted to start just by um, noting this topic, as I said earlier, for Christians and the civil government is a big topic for sure. Uh, it's one that's been with Christians ever since there, there have been Christians. Uh, is is this challenge. So could you just maybe talk a little bit about what are the perennial challenges? I'm just thinking, you know, no matter the culture or the time or the place, aren't there always kind of big questions or challenges that that Christians have when it comes to our place in uh, the city of the world? Yeah, um, I'll I'll offer a few a few thoughts on that. Um, just sort of this, yeah, the big picture perennial challenge. I mean, the way I would think of it is uh, one of the major challenges of sort of being a Christian and thinking about political engagement is that Jesus instituted a kingdom that he said was not of this world, right? Um, he he told his disciples, you know, hey, they, my, my, or he said, my disciples would be fighting, you know, if if it was a kingdom that was of this world, we might be a kind of typical revolutionary political, you know, movement, but that's not what I'm doing. Um, I'm establishing a kingdom that's not of this world. And so my followers are going to act differently. Um, but at the same time, uh, there certainly are implications of the Christian faith for social life, for how we interact in, in community together, for how we think about justice, for how we think about the kind of treatment that that people are due by right, you know? And so there certainly are what we would think of as political implications uh, or at, at the very least social and communal implications for how we order our lives together. And so that would, in some ways to me, I, um, I think that's at the heart of what the, there is a distinction between a, a perennial distinction we have to observe um, between our primary citizenship in the kingdom of heaven, uh, in the church, but at the same time, we are sojourners, you know, um, in on on in our various uh, polities and earth. So in some ways, that's I think one of the big per perennial uh, issues we face. Yeah, I might add to that uh, that w we have a perennial enemy uh, as far as Satan and his kingdom. You know, Ephesians talks about this. Uh, Revelation talks about this. You know, uh, the whole Bible is is filled with the idea idea of spiritual warfare, and one of the things that I think Ben and I share to lesser and greater degrees, we don't agree on everything, um, is, is this idea that there's not one political system that Christian, like Christianity can work in multiple different political systems. It's demonstrated that throughout its history. And I think Satan attacks us in different ways, depending on the situations we find ourselves in. So if it's the early church and he can use Rome to crush churches, or if, it, if you're a, a church in I don't know, the Middle East during the seventh century, uh, sometimes the forces of darkness will just smash the church. Uh, if you are a Christian who is in maybe the Holy Roman Empire, maybe Satan will tempt us to take the wheel, the, you know, the structures of government to use them to our own ends and call it Christian. Uh, if it's the church in America in the 21st century, um, then I'm sure we'll talk about some of the the challenges, but but Satan will use whatever system exists. And he will try to get Christians off track of what Ben was saying, which is the kingdom that's not of this world, which is what we need to keep our eyes focused on. So his strategies change. And so I think our we have to be wise to that. And our approach has to be um, both cautious and and bold in the sense of, of being wise to our enemy, but also boldly standing against him. Good. Yeah, uh, the, I think that's a really good point. And just from, from both of you, good biblical and then historical perspective as we get started here. Uh, it occurs to me that in a democracy, maybe the temptation is just that the church will implode gradually <laughs> over time, <laughs> is what it seems to be happening to a lot of institutions in 
uh, liberal democracy. Anyway, uh, what about uh, that's sort of a good segue into, uh, you know, if, if that's the big perennial challenge and kind of spiritual challenge that uh, Christians meet uh, in every time and place, do you see unique challenges? I mean, what are what are they if, if there are any unique challenges and uh, struggles of Christians and civil society in our time and place. You know, the the first thing that jumps off the page to me just from being in ministry and and watching it play out day by day is how do we handle the new technologies that are rapidly changing how humans relate to each other? Uh, If you look at the printing press, we had, what, 500 years of war and instability of governments trying to figure out how to cope with the new ability to disseminate information faster than ever. Well, the the speed of information dissemination has kind of gone into warp speed, and all of our various institutions are struggling to cope with the new reality of anyone can have a platform and weirdos can find each other and feel at home amplifying each other's ideas and create little subcultures of information that can lead people into all sorts of weird and twisted ways. And one of the heartbreaking things that I've seen is, you know, folks in my congregation who, when you talk to them at church, they are the most normal people ever. You look at their Facebook online, you're like, where where did you get this? I, I had a practice. I came to Hillcrest in the middle of the pandemic and I was friended by all these people when I was announced that I was going to be the college minister. Mm-hmm. I friended them and immediately unfollowed them because I did not want my first impressions to be formed by what weird stuff people were posting online. <laughs> and that is genuinely impacting how Christians relate to each other in the church, outside the church, how we're viewed. Um, and we do not have constitutive habits and practices as a church of saying, Hey, we as a community need to use these platforms to these ends in these ways. Uh, that's something that is, is just, we're just way far behind and and everyone is, I'm not saying the church is uniquely bad at that. It's just, we're trying to cope with just a new situation of information dissemination. Yeah. Oh, that's good. And if you're from Hillcrest and you're listening to this, I'm sure he's not talking about you, uh, somebody <laughs> else. Uh, but that's exactly right. Is the uh, the church? I think you're right. All institutions, but it does strike me as the church, in general, being uh, really behind the curve on anticipating where this was. I think pretty easily, predictably going to go, um, and just just behind on dealing with this, on addressing it, uh, and all the problems that come with the that are introduced by the technologies. Ben? Um, I would, yeah, I, I would uh in terms of what kinds of specific challenges we're we're facing as Christians kind of in our current moment, I think there's a few. One is, I mean, in American in in the political regime that we're that we live under that we are a part of right has historically been shaped in large part by Christian ideas not not necessarily a national um, establishment of Christianity but some have even described at least since you know the end of the Civil War um, and and perhaps even before um, a kind of soft establishment of of a kind of generally Protestant um, Christian consensus about um, social mores, about even ideas about human destiny, and then in particular now a lot of the conversations about sexual mores in particular, and that has since you know roughly the 1960s into as as kind of started to unravel at least as a it's not a shared consensus by any means uh, anymore in American society, and so um, uh, emblematic of the you know. So that that has kind of uh, eroded to some degree, I think. And I think that fact about American history, um, it, it both presented some advantages for for Christians, you know, I mean, uh, and was a, in some ways a, lot, a very good thing, but also presents part of the challenge about how to respond to the loss of that that consensus that Christians are struggling with. Um, a couple of thinkers, I'm thinking of Aaron Wren in particular, have also argued that since r- roughly 2014, you know, and I, I think it's the Obergefell decision that all states will um, legalize same-sex marriage, 
um, as kind of emblematic of a turn toward not only sort of a loss of consensus about um, sort of generally Christian values and beliefs, but also what what some what uh, Ren calls even there's a kind of negative world. Um, there's a kind of negative attitude among elites uh, and major sectors of, in major sectors of American society toward traditional Christian um, uh, or Orthodox Christian beliefs, especially in the mat in matters pertain to um, sexuality, sexual identity, and these kinds of things. So there is, um, I think, that's one part of the challenge, right, is this loss of shared uh, generally Christian uh, values, and in some cases, even uh, antagonism toward toward traditional Christian beliefs. But the second part of the challenge, I would say, is, you know, there are responses to that. There certainly have been political responses uh, that Christian groups, um, you know, some of them, uh, you know, supported by by pastors and other Christian figures and leaders. Um, you think of the Christian right activism since the 1970s and 80s. Um, and, and there's kind of been a general um, trend toward religious uh, or cr Christian, generally religious voters and political activists aligning broadly with the Republican Party. Um, and there's, you know, even though majority of Democratic voters, my understanding, are are still ex express re religious faith of some kind. Um, there's certainly been a kind of greater and greater alignment and a divide more more of, of those in the country that are secular um, or or don't express any faith or uh, so-called nuns. Right. Don't don't affiliate with a particular religion, tend to align toward the Democratic Party. And that's also, I think, and, and many have argued that that creates a kind of challenge for um, Christian witness, right? Are, are Christians just a, a kind of interest group, you know, within the Republican coalition? That's certainly how many view view Christians. Um, and so that, the, how to respond, and then a kind of a, a second point to that, you know, um, that that Zach and I talk about a lot, and, and a lot of uh, sort of uh, Christian thinkers are trying to, to think about is, what people have characterized as post-liberal um, uh, responses, you know, arguments for, hey, we need to be more full-throated. Christians need to be more full-throated about um, sort of trying to promote government uh, policies and expressions of faith that uh, then that, that the loss of that is sort of something that Christians need to be focused on regaining. Um, and so, you know, so there's arguments for a kind of political Protestantism or uh, in some in some circles for a kind of Catholic integralism that thinks of the church and state as working together to promote um, uh, Christianity and Christian values. And so, you know, how to respond to that, how, to what degree those are are good things for Christians to be involved. And that's, that's also part of the challenge, sort of thinking through that. So sorry, that was that was uh, a few different things there, but I, I think those are all kind of swirling around in the, the challenge to, um, for Christians today when it comes to politics. That's good. Uh, and it sounds uh, just as you're saying that it sounds like you've summed up many of the issues that I see addressed in this uh, journal issue as well. So I'm just thinking, hey, if people want more about that or that, there's some good articles I know. So, <laughs> Yes, definitely. A lot of the contributors, um, you know, make arguments about bo both some of the perennial issues we discussed and also some of the even sort of like prudential or even tactical kind of ways to think about Christian engagement, what's the most prudent way forward, given some of that, that back of, of general decline in, uh, you know, religious uh, and Christian affiliation, and then all the, you know, the how to respond, the, the debates about how to respond to that. You know, Ben, I want to, one thing that when you were talking, it kind of made me think about with the demographic information, I think one of the unique problems that we also face sitting here is, uh, involved with racism and kind of the history in American politics and how that mixes in with the sort of Protestant understanding of America as a Christian nation. Uh, you can't get away from that legacy, especially in the church where we're supposed to be about reconciliation. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's even harder with the demographics because I think black Americans vote for the democratic party in some up in the what seventies to 80%, something like that. And they're one of the, the highest, self uh, you know religious groups they are very high they're, they're not very high on the nuns i don't have the statistics in in front of me and so how do christians reckon with that particular wedge issue that's even in our own faith of we find ourselves on different sides of a political line there's a history of racism there's present concerns about systemic injustice and things like that and we don't quite have even a language here in the church to 
discuss these issues without triggering all sorts of upset feelings and um, under self understanding of the country, understanding of our own, uh, you know, whatever resources that we have, is that okay? Uh, and this was actually the source of our first article that we wrote together was, I think during the during the pandemic, during some of the uh, the BLM protests and stuff that happened, I, I felt uniquely powerless as a church minister of like, we don't even have categories to start to speak into some of these things without causing massive fights and misunderstandings. Um, and I'm not, I, I, I have a huge thing where pastors aren't, aren't prophets. That's a different role. Uh, the prophet is supposed to call the people to account and say, this is how God is doing it. The pastor is supposed to gently lead towards God. So that's more my role. I'm not the one who's going to be uh, this is what you must do. Thou shalt, thus says the Lord. Um, I'm more trying to like shepherd my flock towards that um, in whatever influence I have. But I think that's just a unique challenge that we can't avoid is, is the political legacy of racism in America and how the church has been intertwined with that. Right. Good. Um, just, you know, maybe we're assuming some things here just about the role of the civil government, church and state. And so before we get any more specific, um, maybe we should step back and just say, what are uh, the purposes or what is the role of um, civil government and just the, the interaction between church and state? Y'all have thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, we do have thoughts. Um, we might even <laughs> we might even disagree a little on this on this kind of Zach and I might disagree a little on this kind of question. And and I don't know that I have a, a, a sort of a full, fully formed political theology uh, that that might be something I, I want to keep thinking about over the next several years. But I could give you some certainly some some thoughts about it. Um, I mean, the first thought that we do agree on and, and is sort of the basis of our um our first piece our um it, it, the, the first piece we wrote together in breaking ground was called the church as polis um uh, toward an ecclesiocentric christian politics um so the first i think core of of what i would think of as right thinking about civil government is that um th it's not the only kind of government <laughs> right uh, the church itself is, in in, in some important sense, uh, a polis, a political community. It's a spiritual political community, but it's a political community nonetheless. And it has its own government, right? It has its own um, uh, leadership structure. It has its own sense of how uh, people are to live together um, that we believe is is divinely instituted, instituted by by Christ, and then you know carried through the the apostolic witness and governed by the scriptures and uh, and all these things and the Holy Spirit. And so that is sort of like what I would say is you know the 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 first piece of wisdom to start with that the civil government had be just just by by virtue of the church existing and as its own um, entity political entity that is that sort of places the civil government. We, we have to think about civil government in light of that. Um, I would think of the you know the, the starting point for thinking about what the role of the civil the civil government is, which the civil government, right? In in Romans thirteen, Paul will say that you know the civil government, um, and he's talking about the Roman, <laughs> right? The Roman Empire, um, you know, bears the sword, um, and it it is good that it does. It it is um it is supposed to promote the good and uh, punish the evil. Right. And so that in some ways, that's a kind of still a kind of broad remit in my mind, at least if you just to start there, that, that promoting good could be fairly open-ended. Um, it, you know, promote, promote justice, promote good order, promote, um, promote peace, uh, defend, you know, people's rights. If we were to use the, the language of rights. Right. Um, and so, now, where I think we might disagree a little bit, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll kind of turn let 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 Zach give his thoughts, but um, I also think there's plenty in in the Bible. Certainly, certainly, if you look in the uh, throughout the Psalms, and then um, even in the New Testament, you know the the Great Commission, Matthew 28, where the the Bible does nevertheless call all people, including I, I would include governments, to acknowledge God, right? To to somehow be subordinate to God's God's rule. Remember, well, we we began with talking about the kingdom of God that that is not of this world. But nevertheless, when we pray, you know, the Lord's prayer, we pray that you know we're acknowledging God's kingdom as the the 
the sort of true reality and we're inviting God's God's rule to be made more manifest. We're asking for it to be made more manifest even on, on this earth, right? As it is, as it is, is for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so, um, so I would, so that, that's kind of where at least I would suggest some starting points that there are, there's a distinction, right? Rendered to Caesar, what is Caesar? Rendered to God's, what is God's between these two systems of government. But nevertheless, there is um, even a way of thinking about the the rule of the civil government as kind of ordained by God for a particular kind of purpose. And it ought to, it ought to accord uh, or, or it ought to act in ways that acknowledge that that purpose, promoting the good, punishing the evil. Um, and some people thought about that in terms of the, the primary role being to in, sort of uh, operate by natural law, law that that is you know generally promoting what is good for human beings that we can know Um not only by revelation, but also by reason. And so um, th those would at least be some starting points for me of thinking about what the role of, of civil government. And uh, I'll, I'll let, Zach, uh, let Zach add. Yeah, so for me, I, I hesitate to read too much into uh, kind of the New Testament letters when it comes to Paul. I don't think that the New Testament is crafting a political civil government where you know the church is supposed to take over caesar's throne and and rule and reign and ben and i are in agreement on that when i read romans 13 i'm like well the bible is against anarchy and we you know chaos is bad um i can be pretty confident that anarchy is bad and that is something that you know the new testament is, is firmly against but i when i read jesus say that my kingdom's not of this world and render under caesar it's to caesar's and god unto god I feel like he's trying to do something uh, that I, I feel like he doesn't care nearly as much about which political structures exist in the kingdoms of this earth. He cares way less than we do. Um, and I think that the main thrust of the New Testament um, and the Old Testament, which uh, is that we are supposed to be a kingdom and priest. Uh, we are supposed to be, we as the church, those who are voluntarily submitted to the Lordship of Christ are supposed to show the world what God is like through how we treat each other within the church. Um, and so what's the role of the church in civil government? I would say it's less a political action group and more we're trying to shape the Overton window of our people. Uh, we want to create, form human beings who know how Jesus thinks and acts and operates so much so that they just have kind of a smell test whenever a politician or something from the kingdoms of the earth are, are trying to sell them a new political project. If it's something that's contrary to the Lordship of Christ or it's it has some kind of idolatry in it, we're just going to be like, mm, I don't know, that, that doesn't seem uh, right or comfortable. So I, I think that the church, our, our ability to um, not try to use the sword to enforce Christian morals in some sense, um, or, or, or specific Christian morals, but rather, uh, inviting the nations to come see how we live within the church. Um, I feel like that should be our primary activity, um, as far as our role within civil government. Uh, I'm kind of a, I wouldn't say I'm a total Kaiferite in the whole sphere sovereignty, but I definitely lean that way in the sense of, Hey, God has ordained, uh, civil government to do what they're doing and we should pray for them and we should if we are invited into the political process take take shape in it but uh, we shouldn't try to build a palace out of an outhouse the kingdom is coming from heaven it's what we're we're looking at and if we spend all of our time trying to make the best possible version of the temporary civil government that is ultimately part of the kingdom of satan um, if i read ephesians talking about powers and principalities uh correctly I think we might waste some of our energy trying to impact that where uh, where we could better be served by building up the church. Excellent. And I think that's a good segue to uh, you guys talking just a little bit about your article uh, in particular in this issue, uh, which is what you call the Daniel option. So uh, tell us about the Daniel option. Uh, what is this? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of start us off. Um, so yeah, there's, there's been a kind of discourse of different options 
for for the last several years maybe we're maybe you know maybe we're feeding it too much and so it's 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 uh we're we're kind of riding that wave but that's okay um we're there's been a, this we would we, the the situations both the perennial and the specific challenges we talked talked about about how to respond to this to these challenges for christians there's there's there have there have emerged a few arguments for different options one the probably the most well known and famous one is called the benedict option um, which is by, you know, by Rod Dreher. He wrote some articles and then a book on called the Benedict Option. And it's meant to suggest um, not quite a complete withdrawal from the broader society, but it certainly is meant to suggest a response that is like, um, uh, is monastic in character or somehow informed by, you know, the Benedictine order, um, you know, founded by St. Uh, Saint Benedict. Uh, in the seventh century, I think, and uh, it is meant to suggest, you know, hey, the we we are going to face more challenges from the public uh, realm. We we cannot assume that, for instance, our children are going to be educated well in public schools, right? In in the United States, given the loss of the sort of Christian consensus we talked about, we may even face uh, kinds of um, more or less discrimination as Christians, at least if Christians who are going to hold to uh, orthodox teaching about traditional orthodox teaching about sexuality, for instance. Um, and we need to be, we need to expect that, right? We need to build communities that, um, that re that reshift our, pri that shift our priorities, uh, not into um, professional advancement and trying to sort of uh, make our way in the dominant culture, but in fact, to kind of Make sure we're 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 building communities that that form uh, deeply rooted Christians, um, and we think there's a lot to commend itself to that, um, and so that's part of it. But you have other um, arguments, so different options. Like one, uh, Chad Pecknold uh, wrote soon after that on uh, the Dominic option or the Dominican option, and that recognizes the need for deep formation of Christians, but at the same time says there's an inherently evangelistic. Uh, you know, witness oriented element of Christ of the Christian life, uh, including that, you know, we need to be tr focused on converting more people and also converting the public square, as he put it. Right. There's a there's a public witness element, um, you know, to the Christian faith. And I mean, we also think there's some degree of of truth to that. I think at least I'll I don't, I don't want to speak for Zach, but I mean, I think that's part of what we're we do acknowledge. There's 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 truth. To that. And then there's others. Right. People have talked about the Augustan option. You know, Augustine, the famous theologian who wrote the the City of God, uh, just as as kind of the the Roman Empire was was facing a lot of challenges, and many people were blaming Christianity for the sack of Rome by the Visigoths. You know, sort of the decline of of uh, the prestige of and and power of the Roman Empire, and and Augustine responded and built his own theo uh, sort of theology of history, or or or. Uh, um, but as good Protestants, we had to pick a Bible character. You know, they're adding all these saints. We are. That's right. Daniel, you know, it's the Bible. So <laughs> Bible things by right. Bible names. Yes. Right. <laughs> Not just Protestants. Yeah. Restoration movement. Uh... Restoration movement. <laughs> that's um, right. The Bible is spoken in Daniel. Go ahead, Ben. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's, that's great. Um, and, and we're not the first, by the way, we didn't coin the Daniel option. Um, a number of writers, um, I, I can't remember all of them. Uh, I know Marvin Alasky wrote an article on the Daniel option for World Magazine um uh, james k a smith is one writer in who in comment um you know invokes the daniel daniel as a as a kind of figure we should pay attention to um so there's there's other writers certainly who have who have mentioned that we, we kind of think about ourselves as developing this option but yeah zach why don't you i'll, I'll turn it over to you kind yeah. of the character of that oh, option a, a big thing for us is is i i'm hugely influenced by uh timothy keller uh he's he's my my yoda uh, and so a big thing that his ministry has always talked about is, is the city, um, Jeremiah 29, you know, seek the prosperity of the city in which you find yourself for where it, as it prospers, so you prosper. And that's really how he, uh, framed Redeemer Presbyterian church and, and built that into the ministry that it was, uh, with the whole, help of the Holy spirit. And, and I, um, uh, I think that the Daniel option, we're trying to, to find that middling point between the Benedictine withdrawal to create community and kind of the Dominican, let's shape the public square. Um, you need both, um, because as we talk about in the article, 
uh, we want people like Daniel who can interact with the court of of whichever you know Darius or um, Nebuchadnezzar, whichever court he finds himself. They're, they're well versed in the city. They're well versed in the the politics and the understanding. Um, but also, they are so formed by uh, who God is and who they are that they can, you know, say no to the food of the king's table. They can not bow to the golden uh, statue. They can pray even when they're told not to. Um, and I think Daniel really is a great book of the Bible that is that is oriented towards Christians living in exile. Um, and as America moves more post-Christian, it's hard for me to see that as much uh, living in Abilene. But with social media and information, you know, it, it feels different here now than it, I'm sure it did 20, 30 years ago. Um, but we need to be formed, but we need to engage. And I think that's the main reason that would be my main pushback on, on Dreer um, with the Benedict option is I think that the system that it orients is, is a hunker down and withdraw, um, not be formed for the sake of the world. Um, and when I look at what the Christians did in the early church, uh, when I look at what kind of Christians have done throughout church history, um, our formation is not for ourselves. You know, Genesis 12, you're blessed to be a blessing. Um, that's so for foundational to, to who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. I think that we must build up our communities in order that we can speak truth and in life into civil society um, because all of it is God's. Uh, there's uh, my favorite Kiefer quote, you know, there's nothing under all of heaven in which the Lord Jesus Christ does not declare mine. Um, and I grew up with a segmented view of, well, there's my political self over here, and then there's my school self over here, and then there's my church self here. And I think that fundamentally misses what the New Testament is trying to get its uh, get Christians to do, which is be fully formed um, into the people of God and disciples of Jesus, and then through those communities, uh, partner with God in the renewal and restoration of the world. That was a little outside the scope of the paper, but you know that's kind of no, hard. that's that's great. It sounds like um, it's a bit of uh, this uh, Daniel option. Then you see is a, a bit of uh, a balance between these that uh let's say extremes where you on the one hand are a little more emphasizing withdrawing from society that being benedict option uh the other where there's a lot more emphasis on maybe using the secular institutions to change culture it's kind of the best of both worlds here it's not quite the post-liberal as ben said full-throated uh injecting christian values into secular government but inviting more inviting persuading than any kind of um coercing and maybe it's just the biblical option kind of like you said zang this is this is the bible option uh i think of the what, what i've always called i think maybe old testament scholars have called it this too just the survival literature in the old testament so there's daniel there's also uh genesis 37 through 50 Joseph uh, in Egypt, which is probably written at the time of Jews in Babylon, you know, uh, and then Esther, all of those where you have uh, Jews living in exile, but engaging in those case in all of these cases uh, in the pagan institutions in the city of the world, uh, but doing so in a way that doesn't compromise their faith uh are so are there other uh, what else do we want to say about just how the daniel option differs from or is similar to like the benedict option or other things out there i think that the only thing that i would i would maybe add on is just the importance of uh you know, formation. You, if if this is the middle, the middling road, like you're talking about, like what I think we would like to think it, of it as, um, we need to be more monastic in our personal formation and in our communal formation. We need to disengage from uh, the media sources, the uh, technology usage. Like if we're if you're not living differently than everyone else, you're going to create people like everyone else. Uh, so. I think that that we must withdraw for you know to an extent, uh, but then re-engaging in a very careful and sober-minded way is something that I think 
I would want to stress about the Daniel option is you, know, you got to pick your pick your battles carefully, pick your political alliances carefully, um, really have a good idea of what you're trying to accomplish in the public square. Uh, Justin Gibney in the AND campaign, I think, has done some really good work talking about um, how Christians might do temporary political engagements. I know Ben's kind of read a lot of that stuff and, and could speak to some of that, but uh, just being thoughtful in your engagement. Um, I, I'm a card carrying uh, member of the Edmund Burke Society. Uh, you know, what do I want? Moderate reform. When do I want it in due course? Uh, so <laughs> just let's uh, boldly incrementally change the world for Jesus without manipulating people and forcing them to do what we tell them. Is this um, I, part of it? I'm, I'm wondering how much of this is a different in terms of like scope. So if you think about the Benedict option, um, you know, Dreher insists over and over again that it's not about withdrawal. I uh, mean, he's not wanting to withdraw. It sounds a lot like withdrawal, but that's not what it is. But it does seem to me sometimes, you know, if you have to keep saying that after people have read the book, maybe you didn't spell it out just right. Um, but I'm wondering if the focus is like, seems like the Benedict option is more locally focused, right? So it's it really is more about, look, build a community capable of sustaining the faith. Um, and to do that, you you got to stop thinking sort of national politics, you know, and that part of the problem with the states today is that um, everything is national, you know, nobody really pays attention to local stuff anymore. Um, but I mean, that's how you, that's how you make a difference it seems to me. So do you think, do you see the Daniel option as, you know, sort of locally focused or more nationally focused, you know, that sort of thing? Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I think it could, it, it can speak to both, you know, local and national politics, kind of a general posture toward, toward politics. Um, yeah. On the one hand, um, sort of, we, we talk a lot about, um, you know, trying to form martyred, martyrdom ready Christians, you know, I mean, if, if, if Roger Ayer is right and the Benedict, and there's, you know, some, some reason to think that he's, he's not, he's not off on the sort of um, public uh, challenges that Christians are going to face to our, to our faith. Um, you know, we need to be, be equipped and prepared for that, that the, the church has historically, um, and even today in in some situations like in China and other places has has even thrived in the midst of serious uh, opposition and even persecution. And so we need to kind of develop a mindset that expects that and is ready for that. But at the same time, like Daniel, like the experience of um, the people of God in exile, that doesn't mean we stop preaching in the public square, you know, or stop, um, you know, expressing uh, or or uh, expressing what uh, the gospel in, in in the public square, and so um, uh, Todd, your your point connects to a couple of the other articles too in the issue. Um, one is Jim Rogers' um, article on um, kind of the the actually the way that uh, churches kind of o had a kind of over reliance on the public culture for much of our history. And that may be part of the problem that we've kind of uh, been free riding a little bit on the sort of moral consensus that did exist in, in American society. And so it's, it's, it's actually led to a weakening of our ecclesial structures. And, and so we need to focus on building that distinctive uh, kind of community kind of polity that, that uh, the church ought to be. And then uh, also Jason Jewell's article, he, he makes an argument that we ought to, um, support political decentralization rather than furthering the the centralizing processes that have happened. You know, when we think of politics, we only think of the national um, the national government, and that's the only way to influence the public square. Um, that's not the case, right? There's lots of avenues, um, and um, so that that just just to make a, a connection there. Um, so I, I think it could be both. Um, one one sort of article I would point uh, people to is I think we cited. By Peter Lightheart. It's called Micro Christendoms. I think it was a First Things um, article. And this was a, just a, the, the point that, hey, there, while we might think of sort of um, there being an antagonism in the broader public culture and many um, in many sectors of American society, an antagonism to Christian uh, faith and, and to Christians to some degree, 
Um, there's lots of examples at the local level of fruitful cooperation, not necessarily, you know, like Zach saying, not imposing beliefs, but just just ministers and pastors going to civic leaders and saying, hey, what can we pray for you about? You know, um, what what kinds of where is where is there injustice in our society? Where can we um, support efforts to alleviate or mitigate uh, that that injustice or to raise awareness about it? These these kinds of things. So I think there is that that is something that and that's also something that Justin Gibney and others talk about in the and campaign is that, hey, begin local, begin where you're uh, where you where God has placed you as a church and then as a as an individual, rather than thinking that, you know, we're going to sort of take the reins of of, of the national level, uh, national level politics and affect uh, positive change that way. Ben and I have a kind of a uh, I've got a running joke where I don't quite I might believe it. I don't know where I think that, you know, Christians can be leaders in any form of government except for democracy. Um, and it's a joke in the sense, but, but this idea of the part, the process of getting elected of kind of self-glorifying and really trying to get all these political interests to just like buy into you, there's so many perverse incentives, the bigger you get. Uh, so if you're trying to run for your local city council, I think you can do that with the utmost of integrity. Uh, we have two city council members at Hillcrest. They're great people. Um, they are awesome resources for our church. They can inform us about city issues. We, we really um, appreciate them. Uh, we have people on the school board at our church. Uh, that's something that I think is a really good way of getting involved in your local community. Um, but the higher levels of government, the amount of money and perverse incentives that create, it just, it's harder and harder. So I would say, yeah, definitely local is the area in which we we can have not only the amount more influence, but also I think a healthy and safe influence. I think one of the big problems of, uh, that we face as Christians is a loss of credibility because of some of the fruit of the 70s and 80s and the kind of rise of religious right and uh, fragmentation of that throughout the history. So um, definitely, I'd say I'd say starting local um, and focusing local is probably a good thing. What I took from uh, the Benedict option early on, even before uh, Dreyer's book, when he was using that term in some of his articles and writings. Uh, and I think this overlaps also with maybe all of these options and Daniel for sure <clears throat> is uh, what I took from it is just the church um, being the church. Like that's what he's calling the church to be, you know, a distinct community. So Zach, when you say like, you know, if, if the church can model, this is the one way I take it, this influence kind of a good light and leaven for society that can be uh, persuasive and inviting to others. Um, I don't know if, I mean, there's the problem. That, that's the solution, but that's also the problem, is that the church just isn't or hasn't been, in general, I'm speaking in broad strokes here, but uh, hasn't been that distinct community. We've looked too much like the world, and we've tried to, in it, the in sort of the best of circumstances, we've tried to influence through worldly mechanisms and uh, you know, power plays or whatever else, maybe because we haven't been a distinct community, we haven't been able to do the persuasive sort of thing, especially in this uh, negative world that uh, Ben spoke of earlier. So it seems like that's the challenge. And just, again, when I read Benedict Option, I just thought, man, this is calling the church to be the church call it Benedict, call it whoever, the Bible option or whatever, but it seems like that's the, that's the struggle. That's the challenge. I, I'd certainly agree. Um, that's something that, that I think is, is necessary. One of the things that gives me hope is uh, I think that, that the opportunity is actually not at the up higher ends of society, but at the, the lower ends of society. So it, we have lost credibility with the intellectual elites of the country. We've lost credibility with lots of the suburbanites of the country. Uh, there are people, there, there, there are fragmenting communities at the lower echelons of society, the, the, the poor among us, uh, where the church can step in in real tangible ways. Um, and over time, seeing families healed and restored within our churches in very small ways, it's not going to get press. 
uh, but it's going to have generational impact on communities. And like our church has this program called Safe Families that steps in, uh, tries to step in before CPS does and help get uh, parents uh, clean so that they can take care of their kids and keep the family together and bring them to church. And, you know, our church would be your standard traditional church of Christ that people would assume all of the, well, they're, you know, MAGA, whatever, you know, and it, it's not. Um, we've got a bunch of people who are, really caring for the neighbors next door. And I know that I, I, I know that in the national conversation, it doesn't feel that way, but I see evidences of uh, generations being changed by churches in small ways, faithfully stepping into um, building the community that God wants us to build. And so, you know, that gives me hope. Um, I don't, I, I think Ben might, might have something to, to add uh, in a different way, but, um, but yeah, so that's the thing that gives me hope in that. So I, I would just agree with the with the the yeah that is I mean we agree with that and so far as that's what the Benedict Benedict option means is you know the church being more distinctively more fully uh, the church definitely I I I think we we support that that approach part of what we think that means is that let's you know let's and we I think we use the term um we we want to advocate a socio legally distinct. Uh, and a thick and distinct kind of uh, vision for the church um, that the church again has the church is its its own sort of polis and so when we when Christians think about um, um, even even about you know young, I think young people today even you you'll hear some of this kind of language on uh, Christian college uh, campuses you know is that we're we're, we're going to go out and change the world right. Um, and that's, you know, there's there's plenty of avenues for service in the world as as Christians. But we think that there needs to be a bit more focus on helping to build the community that is the church. Right. Helping to um, uh, generate these these um, distinctive uh, practices of of confession and repentance of, of of prayer life and then of, you know, even you know, think we, we talk about in our first piece together, you know, even just just things like shared meals together, shared um, cultivating a, a thick kind of community life that is uh, inviting and attractive, um, that that is edifying um, and that helps to form our, you know, our imaginations, our our whole way of being. And it's not simply, you know, this is kind of one of those tropes to say, but, you know, it's not just going to church on Sunday and then then that's the extent of what it means to be a Christian. Then you go out in the world and change. No, um, you know, the, the, the life of the church is in some, in some sense, the, the, uh, if you can say the, the sort of more real thing that we as Christians are, are participating in, this is the, the, um, you, know, try, you know, participating in the kingdom of God as, as fully as we, as we can on earth. Um, and so that definitely we agree with, um, there's a couple of lines that we quote and, and arguments we we mentioned from C.S. Lewis. One of them is that, um, you know, the people who were best able to change the world, I can't remember, I can't get it exactly, but the people, if you look in history, the people who were best able to sort of change the world in a positive way were most focused on um, the the other world, the afterlife, the sort of the, the, the things that are going to endure eternally. Um, and so we we sort of agree with that. And then he specifically mentions this is in Britain in, you know, I think the the, the 1960s, where he's saying, look, we need the church should have its own, for in, for example, its own law of marriage. You know, I mean, the we if we're in a situation and we we more and more are where we're in a situation where the laws may and, and they maybe they should, maybe and I actually do think it would be a good thing if the laws of our polity reflected you know, the norms of marriage that Christ taught. Um, but if th they don't, right, the church needs to focus even more on ensuring that in in our uh, sort of communal structure, we model that distinctive. Uh, and, that, and that is a kind of socio-legal sort of way of thinking about the church that we think is a little bit lacking. And this is a big challenge. I think this is one of the biggest and most pressing challenges is, and it's a little bit uncomfortable because they're, um, there's some degree of line drawing that needs to be done, right? Or some degree of saying, okay, what kinds of things should the, what kind of norms and practices should the church make a part of its social life? And that's, that's going to be uncomfortable for a lot of people who have imbibed, um, you know, beliefs about uh, sexual behavior that violate 
the teachings of Christ or, or biblical teaching in general, ideas about, you know, um, the idea of uh, the transgender ideology, you know, these kinds of things. And so we, we need to stand opposed to that. And for uh, the the vision that I know that, you know, uh, the Center for Christian Studies has talked about of, of sexual ethics, for instance, that we believe ultimately are, are more life giving and more um, in line with the, the reality of human nature, as we've been been given to understand it through both revelation and reason. So I can actually give a practical example of this playing out in my own college ministry um, with of where how can the church be viewed as more real than the state uh, during the pandemic? Uh, there were I, I, I'm a college minister. I do lots of weddings um, and I am consistently faced with uh, here at ACU. There are kids who if your parent is a full-time professor at ACU, then the kid has a scholarship. If the kid gets married, they're no longer a dependent, so they lose their scholarship. So you have kids who want to get married, um, but they uh, would then have to incur all sorts of, of money, uh, of, of legal of indebtedness, not legal problems, but indebtedness for getting married, which- The marriage penalty. A marriage penalty. <laughs> Um, but so one of the suggestions that, uh, and, and I, that it, this also during the pandemic, there were people who they wanted to get married, but they couldn't do the big ceremony, the church wedding, as they would say. So they went and got married at the justice of the peace and filled out the paperwork, started living together and having sex. But then they did the church wedding a year later so that they could have the big party. And so that sh shows you that our people think about weddings as well, the church wedding is the party for all the family stuff. The real marriage is filling out the paperwork with the government. And that is just so central to the problem that I see of no, no, no. The covenant before God is the real thing. The, the, the paperwork you fill out with the government is the secondary thing that, okay, whatever it's the government paperwork. Who cares about that? What have you done before God and your covenant community and, and so I see that as a huge thing. I, I made a kind of joking suggestion to uh, two of my students who are waiting to get married for a year so that they can finish up their school. I was like, why don't you just, you know, fill out the paperwork next year, you get married now uh, before God will figure that out. And I'm not suggesting we perjure ourselves or anything like that. It was a joke. Um, but it was like totally incomprehensible to them. And I talked to my church staff about it and they looked at me like I was from Mars. Uh, just suggesting that the church thing was the real thing and the state thing was the lesser thing. Uh, and so it, there is a lot of work to be done, but that's the kind of work that I hope we can do uh, moving forward. Yeah, that's interesting. I've seen that on the other end of life where uh, a widow and a widower, and if they got married, the widow would have lost the husband that, who passed his pension and they just couldn't, you know, financially, they wouldn't be able to pull it off. So it is a marriage penalty um, for sure um yeah interesting difficult things to to navigate i'm wondering and this may be too far afield so keith rein me back in if it is but how uh you know I, liberalism capital l liberalism and one of these days we ought to have another podcast and talk about Deneen and all that he's suggesting about you know is it baked into the cake of liberalism but in some ways, it's totalizing, right? Um, I mean, I, I when I read Benedict Option, uh, I mean, I love it. Obviously, it, like like Keith said, it's okay. It's the church being the church, forming a thick community and with thick practices and all that kind of stuff. But you would have to move to you know, backwoods Montana, uh, to be left alone to practice it in some ways. You know what I'm saying? It's um. There, if you have any kind of employees at all, you know, and ultimately even in in ministry situations, I just can't imagine, you know, 20 years from now, churches not having to abide by uh, EEOC things with, in terms of same sex, you know, all that kind of stuff that goes into that. Um, I, is this even really feasible? You know, as I read it, I thought, wow, how, how, I mean, ultimately, you know, you couldn't have imagined in 2014 uh, where we are right now in terms of the transgendered stuff and that we'd really be having uh, various states across the country passing laws where the state can seize children 
whose parents won't affirm their gender identity. You know, you, you never could have imagined that in 2014. So now it's like, okay, can we even pull this off? I mean, is it even feasible, the Daniel option, the Benedict option, these various options? Or uh, is it Sarab Amari? Uh, his is what I call the impossible option. Never going to happen option. Anyway. No, that's good. And I think these are good um, points and good conversations to have. I'm just struck by uh, the the fact that the church has a lot of work to do still, I think. <laughs> this is what I'm getting from all of these comments. Yeah. And that you guys have laid out, I think, a, a captivating vision here, though, that it's good to hear. And uh, if a lot of people haven't thought of these things before, if you're met with kind of like Zach is describing, you know, people who've never even thought along these lines that marriage might be a sacred thing that best done in a, in a church, you know, before God and his people. Uh, and that's what legitimizes it. Those sorts of things I think are good for people to hear. I just want to steer this maybe in a little bit different direction here and ask maybe a very practical question, because here's what I hear a lot from from others and ministers, um, we're in a political season right now. Normally we're not, but these days it's always a political season, you know? So it, we're either campaigning for midterms or for the presidential election and uh, that's here or, or um, on our doorstep. So how can congregations navigate what is in our world and sometimes in our congregations, a contentious political climate. Like, how can I'm just thinking of uh, you know ministers and elders maybe who have to um, you know pastor in congregations where people might not get along. Uh, do you have practical instructions? Do you have any tips or anything that we can we can say to encourage them? I think the best that I have best success that I've had in navigating some of those in practical circumstances is C.S. Lewis has um, should Christians have a political party. It's a little essay he wrote. Um, and his basic point was the Bible tells us which ends are desirable and which means are lawful. And it's up to the political practitioners to figure out the rest. So what I always try to do is can we open up and, and talk about, okay, you guys have a disagreement about what should be done with scarce resources. Um, that's that's a, a disagreement that can be had between friends. Um, and, and so can we, um, instead of kind of totalizing the conversation of if you vote for this party, you're obviously a part of the enemy, um, can we redirect that to, hey, you guys have, you, you both want good things. Um, you have a different way of approaching it. Can we turn the temperature down? That's a lot easier uh, whenever we're, you know, maybe we're in the political climate of 2014, 2013, where we're not discussing anthropology of what is a human being and all of those, because those we get really quickly into theological issues. Um, but I'm always trying to kind of turn the temperature down a little bit um, and help everyone focus on uh, the kingdom that's coming and realizing that if our eyes are fixed on Jesus, there's more in common than there is um, that we disagree upon. Um, Lewis also talks about how uh, if there's any Christian unity, uh, he was talking about Protestants and Catholics, it's not going to be found in the uh, the center. It's going to be found at the extremes of the people who are radically focused on Jesus. They're going to find each other because they're both oriented towards the same Christ. Um, I don't want to see churches turn into let's talk about politics all the time um, because I think that's ceding far too much ground to politics as the real important thing and the church as the lesser thing. I think we should just keep doing the boring ministry of sacrament and word um, and develop and cultivating that. And then I love the idea of maybe if you have a Wednesday night gathering or some non uh, kind of center uh, central worship thing, having places where you can address and Christians can have dialogue about things uh, where you have a moderator who's a, who everyone gives permission to tell people to be quiet. Um, that's like pre-permission is a huge thing in these conversations. Anytime I lean into it, I'm like, hey, 
I just want everyone to know that if we start going off track, I'm going to hop in and say it. And they're like, yes, if you tell them before, it works a lot better than if you do it in the middle of someone going on um, a rant of one nature or another. Uh, but I don't have the code by any means. And frankly, every political cycle, I get a little bit scared and sad. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I sort of have two, sort of two, I'm, I'm of kind of of two minds on, on the issue of like, how practically to deal with this. I mean, I've, I've heard people express, um, a frustration with a lot of, you know, Christians in, um, I, I think typically this is aimed at Christians more who are more conservative and more kind of comfortable with, um, aligning with the Republican party. There, there's frustration for people who don't share those views that it's kind of like, I'm treated as as sort of uh, my view as the less Christian one, um, and so I've I've heard that frustration. And and um, on the one hand, I think that's there's something very right about that that we need to kind of uh, as as a as members of the church sort of lessen uh, our sense of the connection between a particular party and you know partisan politics and the work of the church. I think that's 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 true. Um, on the other hand, I think we do need to kind of try as as Christians together to form our thinking and our consciences about political issues um, in light of the biblical witness, in light of historic Christian teaching, um, and to at least to, to make that attempt together. And so I, I, I hesitate to endorse the idea. A lot of people, exp I, I have heard, I don't know if it's a lot of people, I've heard people express a frustration with the idea that there is one Christian view on something or some, you know, you need to you need to um uh think christianly i i i want to suggest that no we should be trying to do that um and and there will be disputes and disagreements about like zach said sort of uh practical matters of of what particular party support at what time um so i that those are the kind of things i'm i'm frustrating with or i'm wrestling with on the one hand i think the church needs to do more to kind of um independent of party politics form our own uh, sense of how to act politically, not not taking our cues from a political party. I 100% agree with that. But at the same time, you know, those views may not that those there may be a kind of uh, I think there is a kind of contempt uh, attempt that we ought to be taking to come to sort of certain degree of shared, um, uh, you know, uh, posture uh, toward uh, a lot of the the big hot button issues and uh, that are going on in our time. So those are those are a couple of things that come to mind. They're not 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 terribly practical in particular, but um, I agree with the the idea of hey, let's have more dialogue about about this um, in a spirit of brother you know brotherhood. Um, at the same time, trying seeking genuinely to form our our hearts and minds on these uh, questions from a from a biblical and, and Christian perspective. Good. Yeah, those are uh, some really good practical tips, um, Zach. And then uh, Ben, you've hit on some good things as well. I, my struggle with this is I also don't want to be partisan. Um, even when those, uh, I'm totally with Zach on, you know, word and sacrament. That's what is forming. That's what's going to form martyrdom ready people. And that's where we have a long way to go, I think, in, in most churches. Uh, I don't want to be partisan when it comes to these things at all. But when it seems like I could be persuaded maybe um, differently here, but uh, my own uh, uh, understanding is an observation is that there is uh, one party that's a little more <laughs> pushing on in anti-Christian directions. And it's 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 pushing and making I think a, a divide here that in, in in ways maybe that some of us even want to resist. I don't want to be anti Democrat or pro Republican. I don't put political signs in my yard. I don't do any of that. But it it does seem like just to be specific here, you know, that the Democrat Party is um, do, doesn't have uh, much respect for traditional Christian values. And I'm not talking about where to, you know, how, what to do with uh, the scarce resources and all that. I think those are legitimate debates. Um, they're all, all probably the majority of the, the differences in the parties are legitimate debates to have, but it becomes more difficult. I think that's one of the, I guess that's what I'm saying is one of the unique challenges to our time and place is at least what I think most Christians uh, feel is that, yeah, it's, it's, 
harder to vote on one side of the aisle, especially in the larger sort of national elections. You don't need, you don't have to comment on that unless you want to, but that's kind of just where I see it coming, where I see a struggle. So. Right. So I just say an appeal to be to embrace political homelessness, um, and w- to whatever degree you need to engage. Like, if you're living in New York City and you're a Christian, I hope you're registered for the Democrat Party so you can vote in their primaries because that's the only elections that matter. So. <laughs> There's not going to be a Republican who's going to win the mayor mayoral race in New York City. So if you're not a registered Democrat and able to vote in that primary, you have no political voice to limit the damage, um, so to speak, of of trying to keep the least anti-Christian person out of it or um, whatever. If you are in Abilene, Texas, where we are, um, I'm probably one of the more progressive guys in the political sphere of Abilene, Texas, um, that does not mean I'm progressive by any uh, any any stretch of the thing. So I, I just want to embrace homelessness, political homelessness, and have limited partnerships with whatever political party. Uh, you know, not vote Team Red or Team Blue, and think about it as like a you know a struggle for good and evil based on which president is winning for the next four years, but. Um, but really have kind of thoughtful, more thoughtful engagement. But I, I mean, I share your, your, all of those feelings. <laughs> Good. Um, we want to wrap this up here just with a final question about resources. I know that a lot of our listeners will want to be directed to good resources. I'll go ahead and plug once again, the journal of Christian studies, uh, May, 2023 issue, Again, where a lot of these issues are discussed in more depth. Um, but can you also direct direct us or suggest just a couple of maybe pretty accessible either print or online places where um, our listeners could go to get more good stuff here? Yeah, I've got a few, um, I guess, books that I that I'll uh, suggest to listeners. Um, one, there's a really uh, nice book called Political Visions and Illusions by David Coises, who's a political scientist, and he just writes, um, he tries to give a kind of catalog of different political perspectives and ideologies from a Christian, and then gives a Christian critique of each of them. And then he starts to develop kind of a, a couple based on some sources in Catholic teaching and also uh, the Kuyperian kind of approach that Zach mentioned earlier starts to kind of develop a, a Christian way of thinking about politics. And he has a postscript on ecclesiology, which kind of relates to what we were what we were talking about there. So that's one. Um, recently, I read a, a really interesting book called um, Faithful Disobedience, Writings on Church and State from a Chinese House Church Movement by Wang Yi. And then it's um, edited by Hannah Nation and J.D. Singh. And that, that actually articulates a lot of... Um, in a, in a bit of a different context, but then than we're operating in, but a lot of what we're trying the the approach that that we're advocating, and then the, the sites people like Tim Keller, um, a lot of historic Christian teaching, and uh, on um, and it's a it's a collection of speeches and writings, and in, in a in the, the context of the House Church movement in China, a couple more. Sorry, yes, academic for uh, you know re, uh, resources. So I'll, I'll give a, a couple more on the list that I have here. One, there's a book by Robert Cranach called Christian Faith and Modern Democracy, uh, God and Politics in the Fallen World. And uh, Cranach kind of what it's really a challenge to the idea that democracy, uh, to allude again, something Zach was talking about, is sort of the the expression of the gospel in the civic realm, right? I mean, it's it, that that he argues that's too strong, right? Maybe there is a way of thinking about constitutional democracy that is a blessing and it's a good thing and it's something we can engage with as Christians. But the Christian attitude toward politics is um, a much more sort of toward civil politics, right? In the sort of in the, the city of man, so to speak, is is more prudential, more um, less sort of um, ideologically committed to a particular regime type. So that and that gives you some great history and different different um, discussion of different how Christian thinkers have thought about politics and civil politics throughout history. And then just the last one, and then I'll, I'll let Zach um there is a book by Christopher Bryan called Render to Caesar that makes the a kind of similar argument about what is the biblical, what is the what is the Christian attitude toward uh, the civil realm, toward civil politics, and also argues for basically that that God cares, clearly does care about justice 
and that you know Christians absolutely ought to care about that. But that that it doesn't um, necessarily mean that there's a particular kind of regime or a particular um, uh, setting setup for for uh, sort of Christian politics and things. So those are a few of the sources that I think I've, I've found helpful and and maybe introduce um, listeners and readers into the the Christian tradition of thinking about um, uh, politics and. I would add, we haven't talked about this much, but it's it's not univocal, right? I mean, there's even in our own sort of restoration movement context, there is people like David Lipscomb who argue that we should completely disengage from civil politics. You know, like we were, in some ways, it's like we were talking about, it's kind of the, even more Benedict option than the Benedict option advocates. It's, it's complete withdrawal. We're part of the kingdom of God. Don't worry about the civil realm. On the other hand, there, you know, Alexander Campbell served in the, um, uh, Virginia Constitutional Convention. Um, and so, you know, in, in the early 1820s. And so he would, you know, he's a person who was deeply involved in civil politics and everything else. So anyway, that's, that's uh, uh, just some thoughts there on resources. Well, Ben definitely took my, I should have gone first because he has more books than me. Um, but uh, Political Visions and Illusions, uh, that Koisis, or I don't know how to say his last name, but that is truly, um an incredible book. It it what it does is it kind of just shows the the moral story behind each of the various political movements. I took my college students through that book. Uh, the during the 2020, 2021 um, era, and we had a great. It, it was able. It was accessible to have good conversations about just different political movements. Um, the second one that I would say my one of my professors Lee Camp wrote a book called Scandalous Witness, um, and it. It's definitely from the lips, more from the the pacifism of the lips. That's a big thing for him is is Christian pacifism. Uh, he almost made a pacifist out of me, but not quite. Um, but it's a really bold challenge. Um, to uh, I think it it highlights a lot of really good things, and it's a it's very accessible. Um, and then I would say this is not as accessible, but Charles Taylor's A Secular Age. If you it's worth working through if you're someone who wants to understand how Western civilization got to where it was. He's answering the question, you know, how did a society go from belief in God was absolute to one option among many in 500 years? And it's a slog, but there are also like, I know there are readers of it uh, that people have kind of like summarized it. So like the Gospel Coalition put out a Our Secular Age that had essays about Charles Taylor I know James K. A. Smith, How to Not Be Secular, has kind of tried to digest uh, some of that information. And then I would say um, Carl Truman's recent book, uh, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, really helps us understand kind of the intellectual waters we're swimming in and why some of the political movements right now have salience and kind of where they where they came from. So those are books that that have helped helped me in this space. Let me make one more um, plug for um, a lot of my thinking has been shaped by uh, my involvement in um, a group that's working out of the Theopolis Institute called uh, the Civitas Group. Um, and we've had several kind of seminars and meetings about trying to develop an ecclesiocentric way of thinking about society and politics. There is a podcast called the Civitas Podcast. Um, that I think you can find through the Theopolis Institute, which is an organization based in uh, Birmingham that Peter Lighthart is the um, founder and I think president of. And so that would be one sort of plug I would make. We've got uh, an edited volume that um, uh, James, Jim Rogers, one of the contributors in the uh, in in the this issue, the JCS issue, uh, the May issue that we're talking about today. He kind of uh, he and Peter. Uh, Lightheart edited. And so I, I believe it's called um, Hell Shall Not Prevail or something like that. It's kind of a collection of essays on uh, some of the, this trying to develop this ecclesiocentric way of thinking about policy that I, that I think Zach and I, you know, both have have tried to express some and, and been informed some by in our in our writings, including the Daniel Option piece. So just a plug for the Civitas group and some of the work that's that's going on with that. Good. Uh, those are uh, some good resources there. And thank you for um, letting us know about those. And uh, thank you, Zach and Ben, for this conversation on Christians in politics. I think it's been uh, really good and insightful, and I hope it will be helpful to our listeners. So thank you so much for joining us 
on uh, this episode. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, it's been good. So uh, thank you all for listening to this episode of Theological Table Talk. Uh, we invite you to follow or subscribe to Theological Table Talk on Spotify or Apple. Uh, these ep episodes are also available on our Center for Christian Studies YouTube channel. So uh, please check out also the website uh, for the Center for Christian Studies. It's christian-studies.org. There you can find uh, back issues of the Journal of Christian Studies. So if you're not a subscriber, uh, you might want to subscribe to the journal. And certainly you can pick up a back issue of our May 2023 issue on the church in the polis. We also invite listeners to suggest topics and guests that you would like to see covered in this podcast. You can email us at info at christian-studies.org. And certainly, if you like what you see on the website or like what you've heard here, um, go ahead and hit that Give button and uh, donate to the Center for Christian Studies. That would be awesome. So, so thank you for joining us at the table today for Theological Table Talk. Until next time.